I am thrilled, folks, to help you start the new year by getting in shape, not just golf-wise, but physically. And Matt McKay joining us, he's the guy to help you with that. Matt, thanks for reaching out, man. Welcome to our show. How are you? Doing great today. I appreciate it, Mark. Yeah, um, so I'm a golf biomechanics and fitness professional. I've uh, been in the industry for about eight years, teaching first at country clubs uh, in the fitness centers there. Then moved on to working for a chiropractor and a sports performance injury rehab clinic in Jacksonville. Uh, so we were starting to see many tour players come in and getting treatment. And I was the head personal trainer on staff there. Um, the chiropractor that I work with was an avid golfer himself. So he built a, a golf lab in the facility. So under his wing, um, I was able to get KVEST level three certified. So really started to dive into the biomechanics side of things. And then it was great to have professionals and their coaches come in and learn a little bit more on the uh, the practical or the applicable side of things. You know, they teach you one thing in the books, how to go about treatment, how to make players feel better and move better. Um, but to see that firsthand and to apply those principles really kind of got me into this passion uh, yeah. in my industry. I guess it begs the question because, you know, me as a recovering golf instructor, coach, um, now broadcaster and you and biomechanics and fitness and overall sort of health and well-being, I would say, what was the catalyst to move into that? Because I'm certain at one stage you played golf, right? So baseball was my main sport growing up. Um, mm -hmm. Grew up in Indiana, so winners were a big factor of that. But at the end of baseball season, I'd go on the golf course. So my stepfather, he played, so he gave me a, ping, a, a set of ping I-2s when I was, I don't know, 13 or 14. So when September hit, when uh, travel ball and summer ball ended, it would be go to the course and kind of just swing as hard as you can, you know, try to try to max out. I remember I had a big Bertha, you know, 360 CC then and trying to max that out. Um, just, you know, playing games. I, I was definitely one who played a lot of sports growing up. Like I said, baseball was my main sport that I focused on. Um, but learning the mechanics and learning how to move my body had definitely influenced and been great for my golf game. Hey, before we dive into getting all the viewers and listeners, and if you're listening on audio, you can see this on YouTube, just go and search Mark Immelman. Before we get into helping folks set themselves up for 24 and beyond, you said something that piqued my mind. And, and that is, you know, a lot of parents of young golfers getting into golf, obviously in sport, I'm guessing with all your expertise and your athletic background, that your recommendation to one or other parent coming to you would be like, hey, let's build up athleticism before we get into golf specific stuff. Am I wrong or am I right with that observation? 100% correct. Um, you know, the guys at TPI are definitely harping that quite a bit. And a lot of golf coaches across the board are saying that. Um, so, yeah, playing as many sports as you can multi-directional, multi-functional sports where, you know, you're, you're rotating, but you know, high to low, low to high backhands in tennis, kicking yeah. a soccer ball, things of that nature is huge. Uh, TPI, they have the big break theory, which is the mm -hmm. idea of you're only as fast as you can slow down. So for example, like kicking a soccer ball, I need to plant on my left leg to then deliver power with my right leg. Um, and that's what we see in the golf swing, right? We have to transfer onto our lead side, first support prior to that rotation. Um, so doing things on our non-dominant side, yeah. swinging a golf club, non-dominant, hitting backhands in tennis, kicking with your non-dominant leg, even throwing a ball. Um, so with my junior evals, I do a lot of those activities, dominant and non-dominant side. One, just to see how their brains are able to operate and to organize thoughts. And then second, just, just to kind of test the waters, see how athletic they are to start with. And uh, usually gets a couple good laughs out of it. But at the end of the day, it's always, we're always looking at performance and looking at ways to improve and to learn, right? Yeah, folks, look, I would highly advocate this. I'm 53 and hanging on. And man, if I try and brush my teeth with my incorrect, my right hand, I'm not very skilled whatsoever. <laughs> so learning from two sides is great. Okay, here's what we're going to talk about, people. And Matt reached out to, with me, to me with this. And, and I was like, yeah, what a great way to start the season. So Matt... You've given me five talking points, and I'm just going to throw them at you, and then we can just dive in from there. So the first one, I feel like you've touched on already, and that is gaining awareness and education. So why don't you go ahead and elaborate there a little bit? 
Yeah. So, you know, taking even stepping away from sports, um, if we are wanting to change in life, we have to know where we're standing, right? We have to know our starting spot. Mm -hmm. So um, usually when we're trying to change, we're doing it for the better, right? Making a positive adaptation. So understanding what you're currently at, um, going through any golf body evaluation with someone like myself, physical therapist, you know, someone who has that background is a great thought. Um, but just starting to be more aware of how you move and where you move. Um, here at the Golf Academy, I have a lot of students that come to me with minimal golf experience. Yeah. And, you know, let's let's use the baseball player as an example. Um, yes, baseball players are going to rotate their hips and have great speed, but the planes of their pelvis, the side bend that occurs during both of those swings are completely different, right? You hit a baseball versus you swing a golf club. Mm -hmm. So not only does the club or the stick move differently, but our pelvis will move differently. Our feet will operate differently and interact with the ground in different manners. Now there is a lot that bridge over, um, which I think is why you see a lot of baseball players have success of say club head speed, good hands, but also they can have a couple foul balls, pun yeah. intended, right? So understanding, yeah, right. Understanding where you currently are and then understanding what is the, the ideal golf model. Of course, there's not one direct way to swing. We all know that, but at least understanding, okay, if I'm swinging in model X, I need to be more like Y, what are those uh, attributes or characteristics to get me moving more like a golfer? Awesome. I, I want to say this because I've been that guy and I think I speak on behalf of all businessmen and folks, women as well, moving along. And then they're like, okay, I'm devoting 24 to wellness, to getting in better shape. And then I'm going to go and see someone like Matt McKay. And then you do these assessments on me. And I'm like, holy cow, really? I mean, I, am I that bad kind of thing? And it almost gets to a place where it can be like this negative feedback. But I want you to help people to go, look, it's just a starting point. This is not an evaluation of really who you are or where you are in life. It's a starting point to kick off from there. Can you help please? Absolutely. Yeah. Well said there. Um, just what I find a lot in movement, we're, mm -hmm. we're very, we're not far off from what we need to do. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. We have the basic idea, whether we've seen someone do it, we've watched a professional athlete, a parent, a brother, whatever that may be, do that motion. Um, but how can we really understand it to the next level? Right. Yeah. Um, going through one of those evaluations, yes, it may feel a little, you know, degrading perhaps for some, <laughs> Very but self -aware, yeah. uh, I, I would say information at the end of the day is positive, right? The more information we have on ourselves, the better it can be. For example, if someone has a nagging back, going and seeing a physician and getting an MRI or an x-ray and at least understanding, okay, is this a muscular issue or do I have a, a structural maybe disc issue? Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't want to hear the disc issue for that example, but understanding that then allows us to then program and to find a specialist or go through a certain, uh, you know, fundamental program to build you back up versus doing what you used to do that maybe brought you into the scenario, right? I'm so glad you would use the word understanding because to me, there's a place also where we like, all right, we want to hit the ball longer, right? And I'm going to do it, go on these speed protocols or whatever. And I get just for Christmas here, a, a few days ago, I got a speed stick or I got a rip stick or one of these things, you know, right. that takes some doing too. You can't just get up there and start swinging at 120 if you don't have that gear in place, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm privileged to be level three certified through super speed. So going and going to their conference earlier this year and understanding how important they preach their warm up. Mm -hmm. Um, and looking at their warm up, it's all about warming up the joints, warming up the, the golf specific muscles throughout the thoracic spine, the legs, mm -hmm. the lower half, for example. Um, so again, that kind of comes back to education, right? Not just rushing in and doing something, but let's learn about it a little bit more beforehand. Um, for all my students, after I take them basically in our first lesson, um, I have a lot of illustrations I like to show. So I like to show anatomy as well. So education on anatomy. Now, mm -hmm. I know some people that may be Jupiter, right? That may be Saturn. But again, it's your body. Um, I think that we all should have more awareness on it. You know, we buy a new computer, a new iPhone, and we can look up the owner's manual, right? Well, our bodies didn't really come with an owner's manual. 
if you went to school like myself and learned a little bit about kinesiology and again, anatomy and, you know, it's not like we have to learn every muscle and every bone in the body, but at least those key ones. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a big factor of two is understanding how muscles want to work. Right. So for example, my core, and we'll get into this a bit later, but my core, a lot of us may think of washboard abs. That's the most superficial, you know, on the outside layer, but in golf, <laughs> yeah, right. in golf and prim primarily all sports is about our inner unit, our mm -hmm. transverse abdominis, the planking muscle, if you will, that's where we're going to find true performance and true stabilization. So mm -hmm. kind of, again, peeling layers back from the onion. Um, I also always ask my students, what type of, what kind of learner are you? Are you a visual auditorial, or maybe kinesthetic combination? Right then when I ask that question and if I get a complete answer, I'm like, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Sometimes I get a shrug of the shoulders and then that just gives me as a coach, um, puts me a little bit more keen to, okay, how can I, how can I get this message to the student where they understand it, right? What's going to make it stick and what's going to make it last? Um, another thing I think about is if I spend an hour with you during the week, um, that's, I, I believe it's one divided well, by the two. Chances of me doing homework, right? <laughs> right, right. So it's like a 0.1% chance, 0.1% uh, of that time influence. So I try to use the analogy of, you know, I'm trying to drop a, a pebble or a, a, a bead of water in a bucket and trying to have ripple effects. So it's lasting. So you can remember it. So you're like, okay, there is an importance of me, you know, doing some glute prep before I get on the driving range or going through a correct warm up if I'm at the gym or at home doing routines. So that's trying the, to make that lasting effect. Well, I feel like that's why the way you laid these out was so important. And that first one where you use the terms awareness and education. Now, look, when we go for a lesson or a session with you or whatever the case might be, there's the education, the cerebral of it. But then mm -hmm. the takeaway is the awareness. Like I'm always trying to be aware of my posture. And that right. sort of segue is very professional by me. To the second point, which is improving posture and pelvis position. Now, quickly, yeah. folks, before I let Matt go, if you've turned on social media at all over the last year, you've probably heard the term early extension. It's like every golf instructor in the world now has cottoned on to this, and every swing analysis I see includes the early extension observation, which nine, nine out of 10 golfers do to me. Um, a lot of folks don't understand this. They don't understand pelvis position. They don't understand posture, not just right. during the swing, but how they need to be prior uh, the, to the golf swing also. So off you go. Yeah. So um, one of my backgrounds or one of my certifications through the Czech Institute, the four principles we look at is posture first, mm -hmm. then static stability, yeah. dynamic stability, and then finally your sport specific motions. So posture first and foremost is going to be our top thing that we look at. And why I bring that up is if someone has rounded shoulders in a standing position, what do you, what do we think is going to happen when they get into a more dynamic golf posture? Oh. Um, I think the main things for that are kind of societal norms. Um, mm -hmm. we sit all day long, right here in America, when we go to kindergarten, we've been taught to sit in chairs. So naturally our hip flexors, our hip joints are starting to shorten. Typically when we sit down, our hips are tilted forward because we want to sit upright, right? Someone yeah. told us, crack the whip on us, you know, sit up straight. Well, we, we straighten our spine, but our pelvis doesn't really change because we're in the fixed position. Yeah. So that naturally is going to cause a little bit more of an interior or an anterior pelvic tilt where your belt buckles tilted forward. Yeah, exactly. Correct. So that kind of can throw off um, how our body operates. Typically, um, if that happens, it's called lower cross syndrome our lower back muscles and our quadriceps and hip flexors become overbearing or too strong per se. And that causes our core muscles and our glute muscles to be underutilized or weak over time. Not right. to mention again, I'm sitting on my glutes, so I'm not getting that nerve stimulation and blood flow um, versus if I use my hands and I'm typing, I'm using stuff. It's easy to again, have that brain body connection to us. Um, so understanding posture. So if I'm in a standing position and my shoulders are rounded and my hips are tilted, and then I try to bend over, I'm probably going to just amplify those dysfunctional patterns. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, well, I'm speaking to the expert, but as a golf instructor, I see the person just naturally athletically recovering and sort of counterbalancing from that. 
And then they're backing up and moving away from the golf ball and going backwards. And then their buddy says, well, you're not getting to your front foot. I'm like, well, yeah, you're just trying to stay upright. I mean, this, right. there's, you Absolutely. talk about your pebble in the water thing. There's, there are ramifications from, for this. Oh, absolutely. And I think a big part of too posture that gets overlooked is our, how we hold our center of mass, right? That's something that my brain always looks at when I see someone holding postures, wh where's their center of mass? Mm -hmm. Is it truly centered or is it already leaning forward? So when we start swinging a club and we've got centrifugal force coming into play, again, big terms that I don't talk to my students directly about unless they're high elite players, but that's naturally going to pull you forward going into that early extension, as you mentioned. Yeah. So Again, trying to peel back the layers and giving this education early on to then hopefully have some appreciation by the student of, okay, this is important for me to do my glute clenches and my glute priming probably at home prior to going to the course, but having that being part of my routine for a new year. I want to camp on that center of mass observation because uh, look, what you say there to me, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. So mm -hmm. help the viewer and the listener if this is, we can make it this generic, just even when they're standing up to understand, okay, where is my center of mass? And then how does it move around? Can I'm sure you can do that. Yeah, right? actually, I've got a great drill. I think this would be perfect segue sure. for that. So what I like to do with my students is get a club, typically a three wood or a hybrid, something that you can feel the mass of the club. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll do with that with students is place that on their stomach and then have them hip hinge. So if they hip hinge correctly and the hips draw back, the club will stay on my core. Not only is that a cue for my core to stay active and just have some tone to it, but then that allows me to sit back correctly. If I were to lose that connection, you can probably see that I go into S curve yeah. right away. So I like this because the mass of the club, we can sense, you know, we can do a little pendulum or churn the butter type motion. And then I basically just tell my students to get that club underneath and behind you. And we can sit back with it. One fault that I do see happen with that, Mark, would be if someone says, or if I say get underneath you, they can just lean forward with it. But mm -hmm. most likely they're going to catch themselves because, again, mass is going forward. So I like to use or represent our center of mass with the golf club or the head of the club and trying to get that more underneath you. And yes, it's going to be more posterior than just directly, but big picture, again, Arms can reach in front of me. Arms can reach behind me. I've got a nice pivot point to move from that position. So going through that, and we can do that with, you know, full swing with driver, but even grabbing a putter. So some students come to me and say, you know, hey, after 20 minutes of putting practice, my back's feeling it. Going through some techniques or methods like that to try to mild out the lower back activation and getting our core and pelvis where it needs to be. Okay, I need to do this for the audio listener too. Yeah. What what Matt was showing there, people, was awesome. Took a, <laughs> took an old ping three wood, which kind of caught my attention, and he held yeah. the grip handle against basically his sternum. It was basically through the belly, and then went between his legs. So as he takes stands into posture, the club head is behind his heels, basically under his buttocks, and as he bends forward, you can see it go between his legs. Uh, Matt, that is just a wonderful visual too, you know, for how a golfer should be, you know, rotating on a proper spine angle and, and, and a good yeah. axis going back and coming down, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of picked up on that from seeing other people do things, but typically we'd see the golf club on your back, right? Yes, exactly. So hold the golf club on your back, but if I'm holding on my back, I can still arch my back and have that S curve, but I don't really have any feedback that I did so. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that if we can use our core, or engage our core, it kind of combats the lower back from wanting to go into that tilt position. Um, and then holding in front of you as well, you're just going to have more core activation because it's touching your core and you can feel that work underneath. What I expect, because I'm sitting here in my chair and I'm sort of, you know, you talked about the pelvis and I'm raising the front side of my pelvis up. I'm sure mm -hmm. there's a lot of that situation going on with that drill too, because it's so easy when we bend into posture to get lazy and to get that S curve in the bottom of the back. So I'm sure the pelvis is going to work. Absolutely. And again, I, I believe it's a lot of our lower core or transverse abdominis. I, I, I like to think about two extension cords coming together. I think mm -hmm. Dave Phillips kind of brought that analogy through TPI, but if I can almost brace my core and then sit into my pelvis, I'm connected right there. Um, they say that's kind of the strongest position of the human body, getting into that flex position 
here in America with American football, you know, linemen are really pushing and exploding from that position. But if you look across the board, even in rugby, for example, kicking, um, if we can have that braced core with a little bit of spine flexion, we can create a lot of power output through the lower half. Wow. Okay. That was point number two, but it kind of blends into point number three, some two. And you said here, improve pelvis control and core stability. And then you did have an ex exercise, um, the glute activation on bridging that you wanted to talk about in this. So when you're going to move the camera with you, which is cool. And again, for the audio listeners, you can go and see on YouTube, but I'll do my best to describe. So, so have at it. Let's, let's improve the, the, uh, yeah. the core activation. Yeah. So once we have awareness of where our pelvis is, let's control it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Number one muscle group, or let's say the two muscle groups to help control the pelvis is going to be our gluteus maximus and then our lower core transverse abdominis. Okay. okay? So those are big names, but basically your big glute muscles. So what I like to have my, my students do is let's use these fingertips, use our hands, right? We've got thousands of sensory receptors on these fingertips. So you can do this at, uh, yourself, Mark, but sit on your hands with your palms facing up. Hold on. And then clench your glutes. All right. Can you tighten your glutes and can you feel them firm up? Right. So I'm just going my... through some basic activation um, will allow you to understand, okay, how how well of a signal or how well of a connection do I have? I like That's to amazing. use light. I want to stop you there, Matt, because folks, yeah. you'll see me if you're watching. I'm holding my ass. Okay. <laughs> left cheek and left hand, right cheek and right hand. And you're right. You activate the gluteus maximus and I can feel it underneath me. But I've mm -hmm. seen situations where um, this exercise has been done with the lay golfer, the club golfer, and they can't because there's right. such a disconnect. And so right. I want you to help the people watching this to say, ooh, I can't feel the glute muscle activate and expand and contract, whatever the term is. Help them mm -hmm. understand that it's okay, but we can fix this. Absolutely. Um, TPI calls it deer in the headlights because typically when a student does that, they're, they're just looking They're They're not really getting that signal. So the, the coach or practitioner can see, okay, some, something's happening or not happening. Um, and that's fine. So how I like to describe it is basically there's two ways for muscle activation. I can mechanically move, right? So if I use my bicep as an example, or I can mentally, right? So I'm not moving, but my brain body connection is able to send that signal, right? So again, our arms, we use our arms throughout the day. So it's easy to kind of get that motion. Our glutes lower and on the posterior side of my body. So my eyes, my, I'm not really as, as aware on them as I should. Um, so what I'll have students do is lie on their back. First, just do some glute activation. And then how, how strong is that? You know, give me a, a number. Is it a two out of 10? Is it a three out of 10? From there, I'll have them go into an actual glute bridge. And then that number is typically twice as high as that is. So the mechanical right. version gets more activation behind it. So let me go ahead and show that for you guys. All right. So come down. The basic glute bridge position, knees about 90 degrees and feet underneath us. Hands will be on the glutes and just going through some basic clenching. I also like to have golfers clench their right glute and then their left glute. Um, just to separate. Yeah, solely, because yeah. if we think about the golf swing, we load our trail side, we have to pressure shift on lead side prior to the club dropping down, right? So Wait a second, wait, 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 wait a second, Matt. Okay, folks, audio listeners, Matt's lying on his back with his legs basically in a 90 degree angle, feet on the ground, uh, knees up in front of him. So imagine he's almost sort of trying to go into a, a crunch or a sit up. But you've just said to me, you made something that caught my attention. You're like, all right, in the backswing when we load up, are you telling me or are you telling the listener that a lot of that rotation going back is stimulated by the activation of the right butt cheek, the gluteus maximus? Yes? Yeah, definitely. Um, I listened to Terry Hashimoto with you. So if he listens <laughs> to this, he'll get mad that I didn't say the left big toe or the lead big toe. But it does transfer, yes, to the trail hip, trail glute. Um mm -hmm. You know, making sure that that foot's loaded correctly and then loading a little bit more posteriorly in the foot. So more heel based, mm -hmm. um, more gluteal or more posterior muscle based in our hip. So how the feet and how the body works, they do go hand in hand. Um, so, yeah, we want to make sure that we get loaded in that back pocket, not the front pocket. I'm sitting here right now and I'm activating my right butt cheek, folks. And you know what? If I'm really aware of it, to use uh, Matt's 
number one observation, which was gaining awareness, I'm like, heck, if I do activate that right Buddhist Maximus, I can almost feel because I've got my heels on the ground and I'm sitting on a chair. I'm like, wow, I can actually feel pressure as I do that, kind of move towards my trail heel. Oh man, goodness gracious, what a I have you've you've may help me make a discovery here too. Awesome. I'm ready to help. I'm ready to help, Mark. Okay. Let's get to- okay, that was all about me. Let's get back to the viewer and the listener. Let's let's see that uh, bridge, please. So here we go. Feet on the ground again, about ninety degrees. Three ways I like to cue this bridging: hands on the glutes first and foremost, and I'm going to heel press down to extend my hips up. The mm-hmm. hands are there. How firm that is, right? We want that awareness. So each repetition, I tell my students, let's get it one degree stronger, right? So okay. if it's a if it's a ten, uh, excuse me, an eight out of ten. This next repetition, let's get an 8.2 out of 10 using a digital scale, right? So hopefully that'll just get more heel pressure to drive down, more glutes to contract while we lift. The second one I like to talk about would be hands just straight out, kind of fingertips on the thigh, because when we extend up, we want to have our hips in good alignment with that. Sometimes when we only get it this high, so Mm -hmm. we're not fully activating or not opening up the front of the hips. So glute bridging, obviously strengthening the posterior side, but we are getting a stretch on our anterior side, something that a lot of us need, right? And then thirdly would be hands at the bottom of the ribs. Now I love this one because I'm trying to get my glutes higher than my hands. So a little bit of a feel versus a real mm-hmm. thought. But that, uh, that idea is if I get my glutes higher than my hands, it's gonna naturally cause me to target glutes and hamstrings. Especially my juniors, they can come up really high, yeah. right? So it's how high you can lift because that actually will stimulate some of our lower back paraspinal muscles. Um, so let's make sure we're focusing on the correct muscles, right? Hammering the glutes, getting some hamstring activation. If my hips are high, I get a little lower core. And then again, I'm driving down through the heels. This sounds to me um, that this bridge, those three bridges you do, and I love the variation of them, um, where the one was just a regular bridge with your hands under your bum. The other one was with your fingertips basically on your thighs. And as you raised up, you basically try to line your thighs along with your forearms. And then the final one was, oh, my mind's slipping my, slipping my mind now. But the variation to me almost seems like this may be more beneficial for most golfers to do in the locker room before they go and hit balls if they're pressed for time and have to play, just because this is kind of opening up the engine of the golf swing. Am I crazy with that observation? No, I, I might steal that line you just said, the engine of the golf swing right there. Absolutely, yeah. How can we prepare ourselves to go play, right? Yeah. You know, the adage would be, let's go to the driving range and rake balls and hit 30, and then I'm good to go, right? Well, mm-hmm. that's one way of looking at it, you know? Uh, I like to look at it, let's work within, right? Let's build up the body, build the inner confidence, build, you know, maybe break a little sweat, not a ton, but just a little sweat to feel athletic. So hopefully when you get out to the first tee, you're, you're ready to go, right? No, no nerves. I'm an athlete ready to play a game. How many of these bridges and how often should people do them? Yeah, I like to do sets of eight, maybe okay. repetitions per, uh, per set, two or three sets of that. And usually we're looking at maybe every other day. Um, right now with it being winter time, if it's strength season, maybe we're doing three days a week of that. Um, but I, I, I actually incorporate that part of my pre-golf routine where mm-hmm. I do maybe 10, 20 bridges. Um, just again, enough where I'm activating the muscles, my brain's controlling my foot pressure. I'm working on my breathing, all those aspects we look at for good athletes. I'm seeing a place where me, cause it's 24 and I have resolutions too, um, that I wake up in the morning and before I even get out of bed. Uh, yes, me on my bed doing the glute bridges on the bed. Is this possible to start the day like that? Absolutely. Start the day. Now, I would recommend doing it on a hard surface because okay. the have a little bit of give to it. So mm-hmm. you have that same push. Uh, the TLDR behind it's your lower back will probably arch if you're doing it on a bed or a cushion. Okay, right. yeah, get down to the floor, get on a yoga mat. But that's honestly how I start my day. Um, I go through some breathing patterns. I'm a big fan of Wim Hof and his breathing style. Uh, so I will go through, you know, hundred breaths, hundred glute clenches, 10 bridges, a few other thoracic spine stuff. And then, uh, you know, that starts my day. 
Hey, folks, I didn't tee uh, Matt up to say that. That's not a pun for promotion for anything, but the podcast right before you was with Andy Matthews from NeuroPeak, NeuroPeak Pro. And I got one of those Intel bands, man. And let me tell you something. I learned yeah. quickly enough that my breathing was nowhere even close to what it should be. And right. yeah, golly, it's a, it's a, it's a life changer. It's, it's as simple as that. And you said it's part of your, your morning routine to, to go through your breathing regimen. We, you know, we take 21,000 breaths a day. That's, that's the number that's been thrown at me through some of my certifications. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we're not going to be conscious of a lot of that. But that just goes to show with that much number or that much data, if we want to look at it from that perspective, let's have some focus. You know, let's be conscious of how we breathe, at least little pockets of the day. Um, I know Sir Nick always would talk about that when on course and in pressure situations, but that goes across the board. Sitting in traffic, things might get a little hectic for you. Take a <laughs> couple of deep in, right? Um, learning these opportunities to challenge yourself, whether it's a sports uh, environment or not will then prepare you for that sport environment, whether it's a club championship or you don't want to lose to your kid for the first time or whatever that may be. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, reminiscent of that one. My daughter's beating me. All right. Um, part of something I focus on with her is your point number four, which is improving footwork and balance. A and, you know, everyone will be like, yeah, my golf swing's out of balance. And look, if that's happening, you're kind of scuttling your ship from the very start but they can work on this. So show us or tell us how, please. Yeah. Um, the number one stabilizer of the hip is the glute muscle. So that's why when we see elderly folks, sometimes their hips start to set, uh, swing from side to side. They're not using those. They're not using their glutes as they used to or should. Mm -hmm. So what I do for my students is I'll get them standing and use those hands again. Right. Let me drop this down just a tad bit. But right. Basically I'll, in with their hands on their glutes we're going to clench the glutes we're going to shift over onto one leg can you still maintain that strong glute and then lift the opposite leg up awesome. majority of the time when the foot lifts the glute will fizzle out because something else will take over whether it's the lower back whether it's the quadricep or a pseudo wave stabilization some students will just lock out their knee and hold it up tall and just pray that they don't fall right yeah, yeah. kind of go into mm -hmm. position I call that pseudo stabilization. It's not true uh, to how we're trying to perform, right? You mm -hmm. wouldn't just lock your knee and then try to rotate on your left side. Or if you would, or if you did that for a decade, you may have to have knee surgery to some other uh, very successful golfers on tour. But mainly focusing on the glute, clenching that glute, that'll give you the stabilization to your leg. Um, and then from there, can we do different dynamic positions? Going back to what I stated earlier, we look at static stability and then dynamic stability. Uh -huh. So can I balance for 20 seconds? We'll just say that number. Um, once I can do that, can I start to rotate my hips and do a little bit of, say, a stork turn, right? You can have a golf club in front of you or hold on to the counter if you need, maybe a fingertip or two on for balance purpose. But then can you internally and externally rotate on that hip? Yeah. So. Again, both of those dynamics are going to be glute driven or posterior muscle driven. Um, and then how do you hold the foot? Is the pressure in the toes? Is it midfoot? Is it more heel based? Those are the type of questions, again, building awareness and education, my student, I'll ask them. Um, like to your point earlier, if I'm loading into my trail hip or trail side, it's going to be a little bit more heel based. I want to make sure we're doing that when we're holding balance at home, yeah. watching your mirror brushing your teeth in the morning, finding these opportunities to do that, I think are huge. And uh, what I've actually implemented this fall, Mark, is when I go play, I do that every tee box. I will stand, you know, if we're going to play, a couple of my playing partners are going, say they hit, I'll stand on my right leg for maybe one of their shots, switch on to my left. Mm -hmm. and That's so cool. So you're telling me, wait, wait, wait a second. So you're telling me that well, I guess balance is learned because when we were little tots learning to walk, we learned how to balance. But we also then, and I've had my trainer and my P physical, uh, my PT guy tell, tell me, he goes, you bas you're not using your muscles to keep you upright. You're just basically using your spine, right? And so, so there's no real activation. So you're telling me basically with that cool little exercise where you're on one leg and you just you know, basically clench up that glute muscle and you get strong and you balance and you start to move around that 
golfers can learn proper balance again, no matter how old or decrepit we are? Yes. Absolutely. I teach new tricks to old dogs all the time, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, look, I've learned something here. I just like to think of it as applied knowledge, right? Or an applied exercise, right? It's one thing to look and, okay, I see him doing an exercise. Let me copy it. But, you know, what are the, the nitty gritty behind it? What, what actually makes that person look good? Um, you know, talking about professional athletes, they move with grace, right? They move with fluidity, whether they're on the pitch, whether they're on the field or the court. Why is because their fundamentals are so set, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these players have learned this at a young age through development and it's second nature to them. So I don't see why anyone can't have that same, say, book of knowledge, but maybe they just start later in life, right? I want you to do this because when you were standing up and away from us and you were demonstrating, um, I, I want you just to describe while you're sitting there that balancing ex exercise to the audio listener, because to me, it's almost a game changer here for the new year and beyond. If you can, like you say, you stand when your playing competitors are hitting shots in that vein or when you're brushing your teeth or whatever you're doing, but it's this opportunity where you can continually wake up mm -hmm. that glute muscle and balance better. So please describe it. Yeah. So, um, stand, stand tall. Yeah. Uh, I would say your hands on your glutes, flex both of them. And let's use our right glute as the example. So then shift your weight slightly onto your right side, keep both glutes firm. But then when you take away your left foot, and that can be either to a toe or completely off the ground, can you maintain a firm right glute? With that firm right glute, most you folks should... it's going to give, right? I'm sorry? Because with most people, it's likely to give, right? Correct. And the reason for that is usually the hips will tilt to the side. The hip will bump out to the side. So we're losing, again, hip stability. Part mm -hmm. of it's going to be the core. Well, but how I like to, how I've seen it, if both glutes flex, that kind of fixes our pelvic tilt, gets us into a more neutral position, which then triggers our lower core to be there when we need it. So then we shift over to one side and we already have our glute and our core working together, those two extension cords tight together. And then, yeah, how long can you hold it for? You know, I'm a big fan of looking in the mirror, watching yourself um making sure we're not tilting one way making sure i'm not you know again going into pseudo stabilization mm -hmm. um over time we build that up whether it's five seconds 10 seconds or 30 seconds right and i'm certain that folks who battle golfers with lower back pain this is likely to really help out am i right Absolutely. Absolutely. Once the glutes and the hips become the main mover, then that lower back can be more of a stabilizer or more of a stable joint as it was designed. Um, and then that works up and down the chain, right? So if our hips are main movers, our lower back is more of a stabilizing joint, our thoracic spine is enabled to rotate as it should. Um, and if we go below the hips, if our glutes are working, our knees become more of that stable joint, our ankles get a little bit more mobile so we can allow rotation, but then our feet are still stable locked into the ground. Sensational. Okay. Final point of the five, first one, gaining awareness and education. We're we'll learning that all the time, improving posture, pelvis position, number two, and improving pelvis control and score, uh, core stability. Number three, improve your footwork and balance was four, um, five. Improve your athleticism by moving, walking, throwing, jumping, basically all the above. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I see a lot of coaches talking about juniors right now. Um, how can we get our juniors moving better, right? Um, I think we should do that as adults as well. I think we get stuck in our ways for multiple reasons. One, we may not have time. Two, we may just be boring as we get older. Um, but I think the main thing is we we don't want to fail as adults, you know, as children, that's, that's part of learning, right? Standing up and falling over. Um, life is a lesson. So if we can go through these and then persevere, I think we're stronger at the end of the day. So, you know, playing catch with your son or your daughter, you know, kicking the ball in the field, maybe going and playing some pickleball. That's the new sport, right? But racquetball would have been, you know, that's what I did growing up with my dad. I'd go to the gym and just whack the ball around with him. So starting to do things in multi-planes and again, throwing things, your non-dominant side, swinging a club non-dominantly, throwing a Frisbee. These are all things that we do for long-term athletic development for youth golfers. So again, we're, we're the same creature. We're just later on in life, you know, a couple of chapters later in the book, but we can still implement and still refresh the program in this sense. 
Um, I have and, a, yeah. I, I have a vision, <laughs> and I want to partner with you on this. And all of our fans around the world and the folks now who are going to go and follow Matt McKay, I'm just imagining us old people just skipping down the passage on the way to get morning coffee. Because, right. you know, over Christmas, we had a big family reunion and it was all the grandkids came there from like the, 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 the early 20s to the babies. And just to watch them all play again, they're running around, skipping, jumping, playing badminton. And I was like, wow, that's so refreshing. And you could see just by doing that, like running and skipping or jumping, just uh, it brings with it a sense of joy as well. I, I, I want to see everyone in this On The Mark Global Tribe and Matt's followers to skip in the morning to, to coffee. What a great idea to sort of start the day with a smile, huh? Absolutely. And now that you've brought up skipping, from my point, that's going to be some natural disassociation. Your pelvis is rotating one way while your shoulders are going the other. You're <laughs> pressing the ground you're getting good glute activation and and working those feet so absolutely skip to the first tee if you don't mind it <laughs> let's do it all right this has been sensational stuff it really has and it's a great way for everybody to start the uh, year so what i want to do now because you've shared the knowledge and your wisdom and your insights is just to you know better movement and better overall well-being now i want you to put on your coaching hat and give the marching orders, give the motivational speech now to say, get off your proverbial gluteus maximus and now go do this every day. So give us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, time is now, you know, whether it's turning over a new calendar, whether we see January versus December, or you just are tired of being tired, right? Yeah. Getting some more motivation behind you. Um, every day is a new day to do it. Yes, it's easier said than done, but understanding how the journey works, right? So if you can think back, maybe finding a not so pleasant experience, not performing well at a club championship, underperforming when a friend comes in town, um, or just trying to get rid of a nagging injury. Let's, let's develop some awareness, um, finding a coach like myself, if it's more of a physical ailment where pain is, is being present, find yourself a physical therapist or a doctor, an MD who can appropriately treat that and give you understanding to then work through a program. Um, but light is always at the end of the tunnel. We just have to sometimes put our one foot in front of the other and work towards it. Yeah, go and skip to the end of the tunnel. Hey, uh, you, please share with, uh, with the folks where they can find you, Matt. And then you also have little like three and four day retreats that people can come down to St. Augustine and work with you. So talk about those, please. Yeah, so I'm here at PJ Tour Golf Academy. Um, so if you're in the World Golf Village area or Jacksonville, uh, Northeast Florida, come see us at the Academy. Um, be a great way of educating yourself on maybe just not only golf lessons, but on the golf body. Mm -hmm. The way I like to talk is, you know, if someone's slicing to the right, they may not have club face or club path awareness. Putting those two together, oh, I can understand the ball. Well, if you don't have pelvis awareness and your lower back's hurting every time, well, we can start to understand those things, right? Um, so we can go on to our website here, worldgolfvillage.com backslash PGA Tour Golf Academy, or just type in PGA Tour Golf mm -hmm. I have a personal blog. Uh, it's on Patreon. So patreon.com backslash McKay Golf Fitness. I've started to write some blogs on things that we talked about here. But more of a, a deep dive, especially for my students that I'm working with virtually, um, can, com can communicate that. And then, yeah, coming down to St. Augustine, whether it's doing a golf academy, a three-day golf academy here where we're including golf instruction, or we can do something where it's a little bit more stay and play um, and enjoying St. Augustine. It's a great city. I don't know if you've been, Mark, but we're on, we're right on the water. We've got the beach, we've got downtown bikes, kayaks, all the fun. So a good way of still getting some R and R, but also learning a good bit about your body. Double whammy. Yeah. People I'm not on the chamber of commerce, but I have considered moving to St. Augustine. I go down there often for PGA tour live and your guys facility is awesome. The driving range is cool. The golf courses around there are tremendous and it's a good spot to go and visit. So um, just for the folks looking you up, it's McKay, which is M-C-K-A-Y. Matt, thank you for your time. You have been an inspiration to me to start this new year correctly, so thank you. Absolutely, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm looking forward to help people. I think one of my goals is I'm, or one of my, one of the things I'm really good at is educating and getting that knowledge out. 
Um, so, so the more I share, I think the more we all benefit in life. So yeah, come on down and see me. Keep it up. I appreciate you.